I want to talk about starting out about strength and weaknesses and uh, God brings us, you know, it's, it's kind of like our, our Christian life. We start out, we get saved, you know, it's all about Jesus. And then it's, as we go on, it's about Jesus and me, which is good. And but as we, sometimes as we go on even further than that, it's, it's, we can take it upon ourselves. The Lord, I can do this on my own. <laughs> I'm, I'm far enough along now. I'm leading the charge. And we go ahead of him only to our own hurt. And I want to get to it. I want to talk about three kings tonight that started out well that did great exploits for God. They loved the Lord passionately. Passionately loved Him. But at the end, they turned out of the way. This Bible was full of it. And if you didn't get to, to watch last week, or I encourage you to watch that video about Balaam. Because God, is, as, as He's changing me, He's changing my teaching. And I, uh, I begin to see that how... that. Balaam, how the teaching of Balaam was, like I said, was it was it was so misleading to Israel because he said, you know, hey guys, you know, you can't be cursed. You know, you're, you're you have a covenant with God. You're born again. You're blessed no matter what you do. You can intermingle with the world, and you won't have any trouble. You can you you're blessed. You're blessed, and it caused them to intermingle with the. Uh, Mobites, Mobitus, and it caused a plague to go out, and 24,000 were killed. And it just, uh, I was also thinking, as he was saying about the uh, world, I remember as Brenda was getting her hair done in Beaver a number of years ago, across the street is a graveyard, Beaver Cemetery, and walking through the cemetery, I remember I was kind of pondering the Lord and thinking about some things as I was walking through and looking around, and, and you know, it, uh, you know, there's all the human remains. There's nobody there alive. They're, they're all there. Uh, they've went on. But I was, I was kind of pondering the Lord. And I said, Lord, if, if these people could speak to me, if they could speak today, what would they say? Would they say something like, uh, "Wonder, you know, how the how's the Steelers doing, or the 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 uh, Super Bowl, or the, the football game, baseball game, the sports?" Would they Would they say that to me? Nah. What about the political scenes? Would they be concerned about the political scenes and all the current events, what's going on in the world? No, I don't think so. What would they be, what, how about their, your retirement? Would they be concerned about, you know, their retirement? Or, you know, what, what would they say to me? You know, you know, increase my retirement, be focused on my retirement. What would they say? And as I was pondering things in my mind, and bear with me, I was thinking, you know, I wonder what they'd say to me. They may say, I wish I'd have spent more time on my spiritual walk or spiritual things or Jesus. Or, you know, all these things here, all these things don't mean anything. There's a deceivement to try to lure you away from all what God's trying to do. The world, the flesh, and the devil is trying to stop you from what God's trying to do in your life. But there's a work going on here in our lives and there's a work going in this church here. And I'm excited to be a part of it. I've seen it from the time I've stepped in here. And some other people have seen it too. The Lord adds to the number daily, those He wants here. And, and so it says, as you continue, you don't have to advertise a fire. If, if, if house kitchen's on fire, you don't have to advertise it. People just come to it. You know, and people get on fire for the Lord. And just, I don't mean some kind of fleshly things, but when you, you are passionate about the Lord, that fragrance... That fragrance when the Lord works in your life and that, that cracking with a warm temperature. I remember as a kid, I was thinking today we had uh, baby chicks and they weren't hatched yet. We had an uh, incub incubator, is that what I'm looking for? With the warmth and the heat that caused the, the breaking of that, that outward shell and that life to come up. You know, it's, it's like the, a, a wheat's got a hard shell on the outside, but through the germination process and through the breaking, through the cracking, there's life. The, the wheat comes out from that. If that outward shell's not cracked, there's no life coming out from that. But the outward man must crack so the, the inward life of Christ comes forth. Oh, mighty Christ, come forth in me. But the warm temperatures, uh, he brings things in our life to, to crack the old man. Uh, we have a treasure in earth and vessel that the, the life of Christ can be shown forth. As long as that uh, woman had that alabaster box and it had to be cracked, it was like a soft uh, stone, and it had to be cracked. It was very precious to her. And as long as it was in contained, there was no perfume given out. 
but in the cracking of the breaking, it perfumed the room. It perfumed all around. And you know, it's, you know, we may, must allow the Lord to continue to work in our life, breaking us, and that, that the life of Christ comes forth. And it's, it, warm temperatures are needed in our lives. And may we not despise the very things we need in our life. It's been good I've been afflicted that I might learn His ways. The very thing that we try to, Lord, I want my life to be smooth. I want my life to be smooth. I don't want to go through any problems. Well, you're not going to get too much. You know, time is short. And it's, if you're going through some things, again, it's not what you go through. It's how you go through it. You can, go, you can be going through things and not gain anything out of it. But the Lord wants you to be better instead of bitter. He wants you to walk with Him. I remember I had a teacher come down for eight weeks, uh, Phil Pelutro, from Bradford. He said, I made the trip all the way down here. I don't know how many hours. He says, I didn't complain one time. Not one time I complained. Thank you, Jesus. You know, it's complaining, murmuring. The, 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 the little sins, it's the little foxes, it's still the grapes. I'm not talking about some great big sins out here. And again, Job, I, I'm reminded about every time I hear snow or the winter, you know, I send the snow, I send the rain, I send, by my breath, I send the frost. I send it. If we can't get over the weather, how are we going to get over anything that God's bringing in our life? Put an extra hat on and a coat on. Lord, help us to endure the winter storms. But it's, it's part of life. It's the seasons. It's the seasons we go through, even spiritually. He wants to take us through some things. But don't, uh, you know, murmur and complain is a major sin. Well, I'm just, I'm not hurting anybody. I like what he said. When we are sinning, we are hurting. We are hurting. We're hurting ourselves. We're hurting those around us. And we're hurting those who could be affected by our life because we should be down the road a little ways and we're back here. We're back here. But by one man's obedience, many are made righteous. Or the same way with a woman. But we want... Uh, we're bought into that, that like Balaam. His, his, the teaching of Balaam was it's, you know, you're blessed. You're saved. You're okay. You're king's kid. You're born again. You're, you're in good shape. You don't have, your judgment's not going to be there. It, it's good. It's okay. Peter says something I said last week. It's better that you've never been saved than if you've been saved and turned away. It's like a pig cleaned off, jumped back in the mud. It doesn't say the word saved, but it's there. It most powerful scripture, chapter, 2 Peter, and we explain it all way. Once saved, always saved. What you're saying is, once you're saved, you can never be cursed. Or you're blessed. You can intermingle. You can have fun. You can do whatever you want out there, seemingly, and you're okay. There's no judgment, but judgment is, begins the house of God. But all these things, you know, dog, it's... You know, vomits, he returns to his vomit. There's nothing profitable there. But it's been better that you've never... How does that fit into eternal security? It, it, eternally, it is secure. But all these catchphrases, once you're saved, you're always saved. Well, that means I can, I'm saved, I can do whatever I want, go with whoever I want, relationships and everything else. And, he, you know, that's what, the, that's what how, the teaching of Balaam. He went back to Israel and he said, hey... I, I bet you he told him a story, the half-truth. You know, I bet you he told him a story of what happened. You're a blessed people. You're a, you can't be cursed. You're blessed. And you, it, you can go and intermingle, and it, it's okay. But a plague broke out there, and that Phineas, he took a spear, and there was two having sex right in front of Moses in the sight of Israel. He took a spear, and he, he threw it right through both of them. Judgment. One was an Israelite, and one was a Mobitus. So it wasn't planned on going in that direction, but the whole Christian life, the Lord is trying to bring us to weakness. The whole Christian life bringing us to weakness. Weakness is a good place. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. Do you have any thorns? But, you know, you're just saying, Lord, get this out of me. The Lord says, I love you too much. I want to keep it in you. The Lord didn't tell us exactly what that thorn was because we'd put it in a box and we say, oh, I don't have that. I don't have that issue. What is the thorn in our life? It, it brings us to weakness. And we're praying, Lord, get this thing out of me. And like my daughter said when she had cancer, she says, Dad, I'm not praying every day to get rid of this cancer. I, I, it grew ears on me when you go through things like that. She said, I'm not praying. That doesn't make any sense from a natural state. I'm not praying, Dad, every, every day, get rid of this cancer, get rid of this cancer. Lord, develop me in it. Change me. 
mold, shape me. That's exactly right. You know, we want to change our circumstances. The Lord wants to change us. That's how he, he wants to develop us. We want delivered out. And the Lord says, I don't want to deliver you. I, don't want, I want to develop you in the circumstances. And that's how I'll deliver you out at the right time, in my timing. So it's, you know, in weakness. Paul had a thorn. He prayed three times. He prayed to the Lord three times. He didn't rebuke the devil. It was the Lord that sent it. The Lord allowed it. Whether we, we our own making or God, uh, whatever it is, or God brings it our way as we're following him. You know, he, he besought the Lord three times, get this thing out of me. But when the, where the Lord came and said, no, you need this. You need this weakness. And he realized, uh, okay, after the word of God came, he responded. He says, I realized that when I'm weak, then I am strong. See, God doesn't need your strength. He doesn't need your strength. He needs your weakness. He can't show himself strong. He says he looks all over the whole earth. His eyes go all over the whole earth. His eyes are looking all over the whole earth to, sh to see who he can show himself strong in their behalf, whose hearts are perfect or completely his. So he's looking all over the place. Oh, I can't. My, I want to show myself strong, that individual there, but I can't. They're too strong in himself. Uh, who else? Uh, you know, I can't. Oh, oh, there's brother back here. He's weak and needy. He's a beggar. Lord, I need help. I can help him. I can help him. So it's be needy be needy and I speaking of Phil Pelutro I've heard said this story before but he was up in Bradford and there was a bad intersection there and he I never forgot this story there because it's, it's so much of the Lord's character but he says there was a lot of pedestrians killed there very dangerous intersection he said as he drove up to the intersection there he saw one a, a sister and brother she was probably about 15 real assertive confident getting ready to walk across the road there and she had a little brother with her summertime a little hat on a little shoes on everything and he's scared he, he's like this here all the busy intersection busy road he his eyes are going like this he's scared and the sister's got his hand and everything and he's just petrified you know he don't want to go cross the street but phil said he wanted to almost pull the car off and run to that little boy and and carry him across to the other side he was drawn to his weakness he was drawn to his need you know the lord's close to the brokenhearted he loves weakness he can work there he can work in your weakness. Have you not heard? Do you not know that the God of all the earth? You know, he, he never grows weary. He never grows faint. He gives power to those who are faint. And those who have no strength, he'll increase it. I mean, he gives power to those who are weak. He's an ever-ready battery. Have you not heard? Do you not know this? Every time I think of that, I think of David when he was out. Uh, and by the way, David was a man after God's own heart. And I believe one of the reasons he was a man after God's own heart because he was constantly saying, God, help me. Crying out, help me, Lord, help me. All throughout his life, help me, Lord, help me. But I've seen it. You go through a circumstance and God helps you in one area. and We get strong again and stay weak, stay low, stay needy. I need you, Lord. I need you. But David, he's... He says, his a group of men from Ziglag, and he goes out in battle, and he comes back, and all his wives, and the, the, uh, they're all it's burned, and everything's in, taken from them, and he was so low. His men talked about even stoning him, talked about being low anyway, but even his men talked about stoning him. He had, he, had, he, he had wept so much, he didn't have any more power to weep, the Bible says. He didn't have any more power in his tears to cry. He couldn't, couldn't cry anymore. But it said, but he encouraged himself in the Lord. His, he took his focus off his, off his circumstances and he remembered the Lord where the Lord had been with him in a, with a bear coming out, a trial, and with a, a bear and a lion another time, and God had been with him. And then he remembered the giant of a circumstance with Goliath. These aren't just little kid stories. Do you have a Goliath in your way that every morning it's right there, every morning and every evening it's right there in your face? What are you going to do about it? You've got to do you got to follow David's. Follow David. You've got to look to the Lord. David never saw himself being in a giant circumstance. He saw the God of the giant. He saw God was bigger than the giant. His focus was God. He ran. He says, everybody, the majority were scared. They saw their circumstances. Now, the whole Bible is, is full of God's people getting scared, hiding behind rocks and caves. 
They're scared of the circumstances, but David saw the Lord. He ran to Goliath. He said, you're, you're good as dead. My God's a big God. Magnify him. Keep him big. You can keep God small in your life if you're not careful. Keep him big in your life, and any, any problem you have will be small. But if, if the more you focus on something, the bigger it gets, and you're beholding it and elevating it, and you make God small in your life. You really do. Make God small in your life. But weakness, I know, you know, I, I was singing that song, learning to lean, learning to lean, learning to lean on Jesus, finding more power than I'd ever dreamed. Learning to lean on Jesus. He doesn't need your strength. You need his strength. But when I am weak, then I am strong. And, and David, or uh, Paul was satisfied with that, you know. So I delight, I delight in hardships and struggles and weaknesses for when I'm weak, I'm strong. I'm strong. So it's, uh, you know, I've, I've shared my own testimony, but I remember being so weak, I didn't even know whether I could teach Bible school class. I, I was asked to go on a 26-day mission trip. My daughter was still walking, and I, I, I committed. See, I have, I have a resolve in my heart, but I still, I, I still said, I don't know if I'm going on this trip. I said, my daughter, she said, you're going on this trip. And she put $200 in a card, and I still have that card, David. She put to my hero on the front of it to my hero, $200 in a card, and I didn't have enough strength to read it. And this is not negative. I didn't have enough strength to read it. He was bringing me to weakness. and I, I had to close it. When I got overseas, I was able to, to open it and read it, and, and, and it strengthened me over there. It's, it's, it was a strange strengthening, but it's, it's uh, these things here, these, these circumstances bring us to weakness. Who is this coming up out of the wilderness leaning on her beloved? He went down, he wasn't leaning, but through, through the wilderness circumstances, he was leaning on the Lord. And the Lord helped him you know, to come up out of there. But it's, I remember going to MedMart, I was stressed out. I said, I don't know if I'm going on this trip. And the Lord spoke to me through the doctor there, whoever it was. He said, you're going on this trip. I said, am I? I think it was the day before. Am I? Okay. But I have a resolve in my heart. I want to please the Lord. I want to please him more than my own life. And the Bible says... That we're, it, it, man will come to a place where we be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. And we relate all this scripture to the unsaved. Most Christians I know, they relate this Bible wicked and all these other things to the unsaved. I'm preaching to the Christian tonight. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you need to. But I'm speaking to the Christian. He wants to bring you and I to weakness, which is a good place. A good place. And I believe what he put in me over there strengthened me for when I'd get back here what I needed and when I you know after Jen went to be the Lord uh, week, weeks after that my wife would just well in the middle of the night and she would say I don't have the strength to go through this how do you answer that well I just put my hand on her and just pray for her silently and it was I don't know how often it was and it was in my heart too I don't have the strength to go through this I didn't have enough strength to help her she didn't have enough strength to help me and we were leaning upon the Lord and I remember one night the Lord spoke to me real clear. It was early in the morning, and she, she welled out, I don't have enough, enough strength to go through this. And I know it's from the Lord. I put my hand on her and said, you don't have enough strength, but he does. He's the source of all strength. He's an ever-power-ready battery. All young men will faint and fail, but you know, those who wait upon the Lord shall exchange their weakness for his strength. All, he's going to keep working till he brings you to weakness. Weakness. It's a good place because then you realize you need another strength. Going overseas, you've seen beggars. I've seen beggars. You know, in Bulgaria and Africa, beggars. I saw a guy in Bulgaria that he was all, it was some cancer for me. His whole, he was all opened up, open womb, and I, he couldn't even walk. And He was begging. He totally was dependent upon another. Totally dependent on another. That's what a beggar, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor and needy, for theirs is the kingdom of God. But David, it said, going back to Ziglag there, he said he, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He remembered back where God had been with him all this. And through that, he, get, he gathered up enough strength. Remembering God. Don't forget God where he's been with you in the past. It'll help you to be in your present circumstance. To remember. To remember God. Don't forget. Remember where he's been with you. That, that's a help to us. Remember where God has met us and helped us. When I was overseas, a lady prayed over me and said, you'll be preaching the gospel to people you've never preached before. And I thought, wow, where are you sending me, Lord? Where he sent me was Hangar 5. 
a pulpit set up, and I thanked the guys for giving a collection up for money, and I told them all about my daughter. And it was a preaching that to God be the glory. It was a testimony of God's goodness. The Lord put, it wasn't my idea. It was God's idea. When they brought the collection to my house, I didn't do anything but obey. All he wants you to do is obey. Trust and obey. You don't have to be some great preacher or teacher or great evangelist. He wants you to obey him. If he's speaking to you to be here, please keep coming here. That's a start. But we must, uh, obedience, obedience is, is the key in the Christian life. We must obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey so you follow him. So when, I, when she said, uh, that, that came back to me, like you said about that door slam, and I, I was at the hangar there, and I said to the main boss when I went back to work, I'd like to share, I don't want a special meeting, but I'd like to, I, I don't want to put up a thank you card. I want to be the thank you card. And he said, yes, and the door just opened wide open there. He didn't even put a time frame on it. I could have preached for a half hour. But it was only, I don't know, five, seven minutes, eight minutes. But I know it was, there were seeds going out. Are you living for you? Are you living for him? That's the question. See, we want to make choices. We want to have relationships. And we're thinking God's going to bless that. God wants you to become the right mate. That's what the issue is. You want to just keep going around and around in the wilderness, all round and around. Round and around, round and around, round and around, and we miss it again, we miss it again. He wants you to get healthy first. But we're out there, we're, we're making our own choices there, and we're, putting, we're stamping God's name on it. You bless me, Lord. And God says, I, I don't work that way. You are to allow me to shepherd your life. I know what you need. You need to obey me and follow me. And in surely good and mercy will follow you because you're in my, in my path, in my way. God never blesses you because you're just saved. I don't show me in the Bible where it says that. But surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life because you continually stay under his lordship. But see, but see, it's, there's a verse in, in, in Romans there that says, you know, greet so-and-so. It's one of the greatest chapters a pastor asks, what's your favorite chapter in the Bible? He says, Romans 16, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, all the servants in the church. And, but right in there it says, many serve their own bellies and not serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Their own bellies, their own satisfaction. That's talking to Christians. But says, but your obedience has come abroad to all men. He said, many don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Many serve their own bellies. Philippians is the same way. It says, many are enemies of the cross of Christ. He's talking to Christians. I said that one time. I'm leaking on them, though. The Lord's leaking on them. I shared it at the Bible. So that's talking to unbelievers. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. Many are, it caused Paul to weep. Paul wasn't weeping over the world. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet over God's people. Uh, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Paul wept in, in Philippians 3. You know, the weeping, the psalmist in Psalm 119 says, tears are coming down my eyes because they forsake your law. He's not weeping over the world. He's weeping over the church. God's people, we've left our first love. We really have left our first love. I say, Lord, a, a prayer of mine is, Lord, help me to finish well. Help me to not to grow cold. Help me, that's Bible, not to just grow cold. That I just put away, and I, I love other books other than that. Help me not to grow cold. Help me to continue to stay in your word, Lord. Stay following you. It's, it's, it's a constant prayer, a desire that I want to finish well. Majority of, in the Bible, they did not finish well. They did not. I can't see how we're people, how they miss that. Many do not finish well. I said last week, Demas could have been put in there instead of the word. Uh, uh, Balaam could be put in there instead of Demas. Uh, Balaam has forsaken me because he loved this present world. Balaam was a gifted prophet, a teacher, gifted in the callings of God, in the prophetic. But he, he turned the deceitfulness of, of money and riches. The cares of this world stopped the, 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 the real heart, heart from growing in God. The cares and all this stuff, the deceitfulness of wealth. Uncertain riches, Paul said, don't go after. Uncertain riches. Yeah, uncertain riches. You have one blood clot, one heart attack, that million dollars goes in somebody else's name like that. Why would you chase after that? Uncertain riches. The riches God wants to put in you is a good night's sleep, peace, rest. As they obey, in judges, as they obeyed the Lord, he, he brought peace there. 
for 40 years, as long as they obeyed the Lord, obeyed a judge, they'd have peace, but the judge would die. They'd turn, turn away, get into wicked sin. They'd cry out to the Lord, and God would raise up another judge. The patience he is with us. As long as they obeyed the Lord, they had peace in the land. You know, we try to, try to focus on other things, but it's, you know, many try to serve their own belly, and they want, God, you bless me. I, I live that way. I'm preaching my own testimony, uh, you know, because I thought from age 13 to 28, I was a king's kid, and you were going to bless me, Lord. Well, I was deceived, but I'm glad he's opened my eyes up to that, and, and uh, well, let's... Uh, You know, many times in the Psalms, he says, Oh, Lord, my strength. You know, God is my refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. How did he find that out? He was weak. You know, all through the Psalms, Oh, Lord, you're my strength. You're my shield. Oh, Lord, my strength. My strength. My strength. Over and over and over again. And we, you know, it's like, I, I believe David. I've really seen a David, a man after God's own heart, because he kept crying out, I need you. I need you more, more than yesterday. I need you more, more than words can say, more than my words or heart, my next heartbeat, Lord, more than anything, you know, I need you. But I want to look at three kings tonight, how they were fantastic in their passion for God. They loved the Lord, greatly used by God, until they became strong in himself, until they became strong in himself. And uh, let's look at uh, the first king, second Chronicles 26. Second Chronicles 26. Second Chronicles 26. I want to talk about Uzziah, the first king. And uh, just going to pick out some bits and pieces here. And he was 16 years old. Verse, t um, I'm in chapter 26 of Second Chronicles. 16 years old when he was made king. Uh, he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. Verse 4, he did which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father did. Verse 5, key verse. As, as he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions... Of God, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And we, we, we Americanize that and think he's always talking about he's going to bless us outwardly. And that's probably there, but the prospering is an inward prospering. Joseph was thrown into uh, prison, sent to uh, Egypt. He was a prosperous man. He didn't have anything on him. He, he didn't even have the coat of many colors. He was prosperous. God was looking at his heart. He looks at my man's heart. We look at our appearance tonight, but he's looking in your heart. The heart is who you are when no one else is around, what you really are inside. We can all look this way and that way and spiritual and look this, but God's looking at your heart. God looks in your heart. So as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And Joseph continued to look at his life. He went down, 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 but God said he's a prosperous man. It said God was with him. Why did it say God was with him? Because he was with God. They were in the yoke together as they were going through this. Stay with the Lord. You know, you know, don't depart from the living God in your heart. You know, very important. You stay in the way in your heart. I'm talking about this whole Christian life is a matter of the heart. You know, God's provided all we need to, 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 to do that, to, to walk with Him. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He talks to you. He communicates to you. So God was prospering. As long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. Everything he did. Verse 6, he went forth to war against the Philistines, broke down the wall of Gath, built cities. Verse 7, God helped him against the Philistines, against uh, the Arabians. Verse 8, the Amorites gave gifts to Uzziah. His name spread abroad even to the entering into Egypt. He was made great for he was strengthened himself exceedingly. God was with him. He was strengthening him. He was weak. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem. Verse 10, he built towers in the desert. Verse 10, moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men, all the different wars and the number of men and the chariots and 
mighty power, verse 14, and Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host, shields, spears, helmets, slings. Verse 15, God gave him wisdom to uh, get the men in there to make the engines invented by cunning men uh, to be on the towers, upon the bulwarks, shoot arrows, great stones. His name spread abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. He thought, you know, he, he was, he, as long as he was weak, as long as he sought the Lord, he stayed, I need you, Lord. I need you more than yesterday. I need you. As long as he stayed in that state there, God was blessing him, working his life. But as he walked on in God, God gave him some victories. And he said, you know, I can do this, God. You, you take a back seat. I'm, I, I can do this. And he, he moves out ahead of God. His name was spread at far abroad, verse 15, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. And that's pride comes before destruction. You, you know that verse there. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his own destruction. And that's what happens when pride, when we think it's me. Boy, you're so blessed to have me. Is it, this, oh, wow, Lord. May we realize we are nothing. He is everything. We are, apart from him, we can do nothing. For he transgressed against the Lord as God went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense. So here's a man that was marvelously helped as long as he was weak. But when he became strong in himself, he started taking things into his own matter. He thought he'd go into the temple here and burn incense. And some valiant men went in and, and went in after him and said, Get out of here. You're not supposed to be in here. It was totally against God's way. Verse 19, Uriah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. But leprosy began to broke out on his forehead. And uh, one of the priests, uh, you know, as he noticed he had leprosy breaking out, he himself, oh, he was humbled. He, he, he hasted, to, he ran out himself. You know, he was humbled. He was proud. And it said that he was a leper until the day of his death. Verse 21, Uzziah the king was a leper until the day of his death. Dwelt in a, a, in a several house, being a leper free, was cut off from the house of the Lord. Watch out that you don't get cut out from your life source. By your daily choices, you can get cut off. Every branch in me that bears no fruit, John 15 says. In other words, there's branches in him that are bearing no fruit. Why is that? Because they're cut off. They're not, they're not abiding in the vine. That's why they're not abiding in the vine. Do you know God is to you what you are to him? If you abide in him, he'll abide in you. If you draw near him, he'll draw near you. If you honor him, he'll honor you. If you reject him, it's uh, Saul, the word of God came to him and says, because you've rejected the word of God, God has rejected you as being king. And it's, it's quite something. It, uh, it says in, in Proverbs 8, 17, it says, God loves them who loves him. I love them who love me. I thought God loves everybody. I thought God loves the world. He doesn't, he doesn't. I love them who love me. God is, is to us, we are to him. You're going to see this verse coming up here in this next king we're looking at. But uh, he was cut off. He was a leper until the day he died. And I believe it just, it just it ends like that. He died. I believe there was no repentance. There was no turning back to Lord. All that God had blessed him with and helped him with and in, his, became famous. He took it to himself. God forbid if everybody, anybody thinks there's a man running this church. To God be the glory. And I told Mike, as long as we keep elevating Jesus, we keep our hands off and we keep pointing to him. He's the Savior. He's the one that builds the church. We stay out of the way and just obey our part. We keep following him and keep praying and, and, and looking to him. But if I elevate, uh, you, know, you elevate Jesus in your life, I'll draw all men to you. Or in the church here, he, he's drawing. He's working. He's doing a good work. So that's the first king there, Uzziah. Let's go to, uh, let's go to 2 Chronicles 14. We're going to look at Asa. 2 king, uh, Chronicles 14. All these men love the Lord passionately. 
You don't think you and I can turn away from Him in your heart? I didn't say stop going to church. I told you Paul and Tim, Paul's letter to Timothy, many had wandered from the faith. He didn't say they left church. The Lord looks at the heart. I know because I've been there before. When I didn't get a chance to work over, I came to church. And when I was in church, my heart was on the ball field or my heart was thinking about money. You, you could be sitting here and your heart be somewhere else. Be where your heart is. Be where your body is. You know. Second Chronicles uh, 14. Talk about Asa. It says, Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. You know, he took away the strange gods, verse 3. He took away the high places. This Asa, I've just got familiar with him recently. I mean, I knew he was, it's been a while since I read in here. But I mean, God had blessed him. Uh, verse 7, halfway down, it says, Because we have sought the Lord our God, we have sought Him, and He has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. God's blessing was there with His king. He had an army. Uh, verse 9, it says, And there was an army that came out against him, the Ethiopian. Verse 9, Asa went out and set an array against him the battle. But verse 11, And Asa cried unto the Lord his God, said, Lord, it's nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with, with them that have no power. Sound familiar? Help. Help us, Lord. I can't get through this, this war, this battle. Help us. And he doesn't hear prayer. He hears desperate prayer, crying out. O Lord, our God, we will rest on thee, and in thy name we go against his multitude. Many had come against him. O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. So the Lord smote. Who smote? Who smote the Ethiopians? It didn't say Asa did. It said the Lord did. If the Lord's for you, who can be against you? The Lord's working in your behalf. Remember last week, Balaam was, he kept coming against God. He said, God, you know, Balak was saying, come, 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 uh, can I go with the men? And God told Balaam, under no circumstances, you're to go with that man. But he kept in his heart, God looking in his heart, uh, hey, I want to go, Let's, let me pray about this. And next morning, he, and God says, okay, you can go. You know, we keep, we keep pushing forward, pushing forward. And God says, okay, you want it? Here it is. I'll, I'll put it through, till it comes out your nostrils. I'll stick in your face, so to speak. You want it so bad, I'll give it to you. But that's not, I'll put leanness in your soul. That's not what I want for you. So Balaam, he, you know, he, uh, God says the next morning, okay, you can go. So he goes, and as soon as he goes, God, it, said, it said, read Numbers 22. God says, I'm, God was angry that he went. God, didn't you just say he could go? And yet he, he's angry? He was angry because he was not supposed to go. But in his heart, he kept desiring. He kept desiring the temporal. He kept desiring. And God sent, you know, the sword, the angel, to stop him. Three times he tried to stop him. God will bring human agents in your life to try to stop you from going your own way. Stop you. He, he, he you know, uh, the donkey went this way. And, you know, he didn't see, Balaam didn't see God, the, you know, the angel with a sword in his hand. He smacked that uh, ass three times. And then the Lord's trying to narrow him down. Got in another narrow place and got another narrow place. God's trying to stop you. He's bringing people in your life to stop you from your own ways. But see, we keep pushing past, pushing past, and ask God to bless them. God says, I don't operate like that. But if you haven't learned it, go ahead. He doesn't hold you. Go ahead. You want your own way, prodigal son? Go ahead. But my heart's still towards you. I won't go there. My heart's still towards you. You keep wanting your own way, keep wanting your own way, okay. He doesn't, he doesn't hog tie you. You can go ahead. But that's not God's choice for you. But he kept, he kept after him. You know, he was being lured away by the deceitfulness of this temporal life here. 
God's got something better for you right around the corner, but if we're over here, we've totally missed it. Totally missed it. And we're deceived in our heart. It's amazing how we can be so deceived. We can want something so bad that we can be totally deceived in our heart. Totally deceived. You know, I've seen it where people make total different decisions. Their heart's desire is to go for this over here. And there's no stopping them. I've, I've tried to stop them. And they're, they're, they're pushing, th pushing through the red light. So that's so Asa cries out, and God smote the Ethiopians. Chapter 15. The Spirit of God comes upon Azariah. So he goes out to meet Asa, this godly man who's following God, who's crying out. I'm in chapter 15, and I want you to, I don't hear too much preached on this, so I want you to pay attention to this. If you write in your Bible, you might want to underline this. Verse 2, and he went out to meet Asa. This is the prophet, and said unto him, Hear me, hear ye me, Asa. I need, we, we all need to hear this. And all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you. While you are with him, and if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Well, I thought God, he will never leave you, forsake you. Well, it says, see, you have to look at the whole counsel of God. We just can't pick and choose different verses. There is three times God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, but you can leave him. It says in Revelation, you've left your first love. I have this against you. I know you're, you know, Ephesus, they were... From my outward standpoint, they were the church to be. That any pastor would want to pastor that church. They did some good things. But he says, one thing I have against you, you've left your first love. You've been busy trying to save people, trying to minister every day of the week here, Revelation there. Look at that. You've got all these business activities going on, you, all busy, busy, all church work. But you've left your first love. You've left it. That's why I said God is what you are to him. What you are to him, he is to you. The Lord is with you as you are with Him. And if you seek Him, He'll be found of you. But if you forsake Him, He'll forsake you. <laughs> in verse 4 it says, But when they were in trouble, did turn unto the Lord of God of Israel and sought Him, He was found of them. God is not a liar. If you seek Him, you'll find Him. And God is what you need. It's not a person. It's a person of Jesus Christ. By the way, I like that Facebook. You need to face your book right here. Now, I believe, I, I don't know, I heard someone on the radio, which I try not to listen to too much anymore, hardly anything, but I'm getting like my wife. I, I hear Pastor Jake says, I, I drove, you know, I asked him, I said, he's driven to New York, but he says, I never even turned the radio on. Just spend time with the Lord. We're so busy. We got stuff in our ears. And I, I, I listen to some messages sometime on the radio. Don't, I'm not throwing anything at you. But I'm just saying, my wife's been teaching me recently. She says, just be quiet. Be still and know God. Just be, i got to turn around. God, got to turn around. God, got to be busy. Got to be busy. Just be still and know God. Oh, to hear him speak to you. Oh, Lord. He's trying to speak, but you, he can't speak to you if you're all busy with everything. Verse 8 says, when Asa heard these words, he was encouraged. The prophet, he took courage. He began to continue to take the idols out of Israel. He heard the word, while you are with God, God's with you. He said, wow, if that's the case, let's move on. And so he renewed the altar of the Lord, verse 8. Verse 9, even, even they all recognized that God, when they saw that the Lord his God was with him, they recognized God was with this man. They recognized God's touch upon his life, his anointing. So verse 12, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart, with all their soul. They entered into a covenant to seek God with all. And I like verse 13, and whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death. Whether small or great, whether man or woman, they were to be put to death. If you're not seeking God with your whole heart, you ought to be put to death. That's, that was a serious matter. Half-hardness. Anyone who wasn't seeking the Lord with their whole heart was being put to death. Well, the wages of sin is death, even as Christians are life. It could be, it could be uh, death in a relationship. Verse 15 
And all of Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. What are you seeking? What, are you, what makes you tick? What are you giving yourself to? What is your whole desire? Oh, I desire this. If I just have this, I'll be so happy. If I have this over here, oh, I'll never ask for another thing. <laughs> Remember one of the houses we got, Brenda said, you give me this house, I'll never ask for another thing. You get that, and it's always, I'm just saying, we're all like that. Give me this, Lord. Give me this. What is your whole desire? Is your whole desire for him? Mary's whole desire was for Jesus. Her focus was Jesus. Martha got busy. Got busy. It left her frustrated, distracted. You know, Lord, tell Mary to, to come and help me. And the Lord said, oh, Mary. Martha, Martha, you're distracted about many things. There's time for that, but the relationship with him is number one. Do you love His Word? Do you love being around His people? You know, do you love being around iron sharpening iron, being around godly people? You know, Christians are a very broad term. You know, there's fleshly Christians, there's spiritual Christians, there's worldly Christians, there's, you know, there's those following after the Spirit, there's those following after the flesh, there's, you know, there's all kind of, there's really only two kinds. But I'm just saying, it's a very broad term today, but the whole desire. With their whole desire, he was found of them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. He was so zealous for God, in verse 16, that his mother was a queen. But she had made an idol in the grove, and Asa cut down her idol and stamped it out and removed her as queen. He was no respecter of persons. He said, my mother is bowing down to a false god here. I can't have this. He removed her as queen. He was zealous for God, loved God. He cried out to God. He stayed needy as long as he, he was marvelously helped as long as he stayed needy. But then the end of that chapter there, all the high places were taken away. Verse 19, though, and there was no more war until five, 35 a year of his reign of Asus. So, there was no more war. And what I saw in that is, you know, you know, war is good for us. He got lazy. There's something happened when we're not pressed in, when we're not going through something, you know, when everything's just going real smooth and just blends away and, you know, just, it can be good. It can be a very good thing when you're going through. You get up earlier, you spend time in prayer, you put your face before the Lord. and No more war. So he had no more war for many years. And if you read what happens in this next chapter, he grew, he grew cold. He, he, he wasn't exercised. Uh, so what he did in chapter 16 is amazing here. In the 60th, uh, third year of the reign of Asa, king of Israel came up, Basha. He came up and he started building some cities there, and, and Asa didn't like it. So he started to take things out of the temple. He started to, to hire a foreign army to come against Israel. He's relying on now a foreign, godless nation, king, to come and, and take care of Israel. And so he hires Bennett, Ben Haddad, makes a league between them. And it says, verse 4, in, in, in Ben Haddad hearkened unto King Asa and sent captain of his armies, and he was successful. He went and, and he stopped the work, he stopped the, the king. And then Asa was able to take care of some things there. He built his own cities there at the end of verse 6. But then, the, the, you, you see what's happened there. So something, he started to rely on himself through them years. He, he, he didn't keep pressed in. He didn't continue to seek the Lord. So when war does come, he, he looks around at the circumstances and he, he goes, hires a foreign king to come, and, come against Israel, the, the king, to stop some things. Instead of looking to the Lord. All that God had done with him, he's looking out this way at circumstances. And it was successful, but it wasn't God's way. He was relying on them. So here comes the prophet here. God always sends a prophet. He always has a word. Word for you, a word for me. At that time, Han Hananiah, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said, Because you have relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. You let a foreign enemy work for you, and you, you've just 
were not the Ethiopians? He's saying, wasn't I with you before when, when I smote the Ethiopians? What happened? You began to walk ahead of God. You began to walk ahead of me. You're, you're doing things in your own. You're dancing to your own tune now. The Lord is my shepherd. You're not to shepherd your own life. You can't be as independent as you used to be. I took care of them because you relied on me. And in verse 9, we talked about that. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro all the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf. Those heart is completely his. But here in this, you've done foolishly and you will have wars after this. Then Asa was wroth with the seer. Do you ever get wroth with the, anybody bringing the word? Anybody ever get your goat? You know, if you got, if you got a, someone get your goat, you have a goat to get. God wants to get the goat out of you and make you a lamb. He wants to work in your life. It's not me. I'm just a messenger. Don't. Like I said, dogs used to. When I deliver newspapers, I'm still delivering newspapers. I'm delivering this, God's Word. As a kid, I would deliver newspapers, and, and all the owner would say, that dog won't hurt. As soon as they close all these little pug dogs, forgive me, whoever's got a pug dog. Dog barking at my ankles and biting my... Oh, they won't hurt. You're delivering a newspaper, and dogs, dogs are still barking at my ankles. Can you imagine him saying to the seer, what are, you, what are you talking about? God's blessed me. I had victory here. I'm building. What are you talking about? The seer approaches him and says he was wroth with him and put him in prison house, for he was a rage with him. That, that's how his heart had turned away from God. So what happened in verse 12? And Asa said in the 39th year of his reign was diseased in his feet. God will work. He works in ways. And until his disease was exceedingly great. So I believe he was diseased in his feet, but he wouldn't repent. And he, he continued in that, and it got worse and got worse. He still wouldn't repent. Still would not turn towards his God. I'm talking to God's people tonight. Yet his disease, in his disease, he sought not the Lord, but the physicians. Many times we go to psychiatrists and psychologists and study the mind, study the heart. Well, God's the greatest psychologist you ever want. He knows the heart, studies the mind. He's all you need. And the last one here, I'm going to, not much here on the last one here, but uh, let's go to uh, Josiah, 2 Kings 22. It talks about, but I'm going to, it really brings it out in uh Let's go to 2 Chronicles 34. I'm going to close here in a little bit. 2 Chronicles 34. Do you know because you love the Lord tonight, that doesn't guarantee a year from now you're going to love Him. Something can come in your life and you turn away. And yeah, that's not a guarantee because you love the Lord tonight that you're always going to continue to love Him. You know, the Bible teach, shows how we love Him. If you have my, He that hath my commands and keepeth them, it's he that loves me, or she that loves me. If you're obeying his commandment, loving him, it doesn't go by singing, oh, how I love you. So Second Chronicles 34, I never knew until a number of years ago that anything was bad about Josiah. I, you know, I'd heard people call their kids Josiah, and I thought, man, this is, there's nothing, you know, I never saw anything about Josiah, anything negative about him. He did some great things for God. Second Chronicles 34, he was eight years old when he began king. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He reigned in Israel 30, 31 years. He was 39 when he died. Keep that in mind. But he walked in the way of his father. Verse 4, he broke down the altars of Balaam. Broke down the high places. Sometimes we need some high places broke down. You know, high place in Israel, they, they set up high places was a place that they worshiped other gods. A high place is anything in our life that's higher than God. God wants to smash the, the high places. Get, get, smash them. Get them out of our way. And then, like uh, Gideon did. God's first mission strip to Gideon when he called him. Mighty man of valor. Who? Someone else here besides me? Mighty man. 
first missions trip, he said, I want you to go and knock down your father, go to a high place, an altar, to a foreign god. And he was fearful. At night, he went with 10 other guys, and they smashed down the high place, and he built up an ordered place, an altar right to God. God has an order. And the order is you're to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. You don't have to worry. All you've got to do is walk with him. You don't have to. Don't put pressure on yourself that God's not put on you. You just love him. Just walk with him. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. Just walk with him every day. On your job, love him. Work unto him. You don't work for your company. You work for him. You, you look at that, that mindset. But Josiah, he did some great things in God. All the way through here, he had uh, one thing he did. It tells us more about it in Chronicles there. That he was repairing the temple. He sent some men up to repair the temple, and they found a book. They found a book in the temple. It was all dusty, and they got it all off, and they brought it down to Josiah and said, Hey, Josiah, look at the book we found. Many of us need to discover this book. Get the dust off it and discover it. You, you can't eat one night a week. You can't eat one day a week and expect to be healthy. If you ate one meal a week, you can't. You got to feed. Feed off the Word of God. This is, this is, this is living bread. This Bible will bring you into a living relationship with a living God. It is, it is the Bible so much. It, it, it is the Bible, but is it? This is to bring you into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. But if you don't have a desire for the Word of God, and you desire to read all these magazines, you better examine yourself to see if you're still in the faith. And just repent, that's all. So when, when they showed the king the book, he... He ripped, his, he ripped his robe. He ripped it. He said, wow, have we strayed. You know, they didn't have any standard to follow. He said, I can't believe that. And he ripped his coat and he, he said, you know what? He started to implement God's word. He started before the people. He said, we're, he made a covenant. He said, we're going to follow God. We're going to do this. And the Passover, he said a Passover that was the greatest Passover that they've had since they came out of Egypt there. I mean, it was... Well, uh, world renowned. I mean, it was unbelievable what he did. He set in motion. But Josiah, he did this. But I want to go to Second uh, Chronicles 35, and I want to end up in his last few, few verses of 35. Second Chronicles 35. So here's a man, 39 years old. He's obeyed the Lord, did great exploits. He's loved the Lord passionately. And he, like I said, there was no Passover in 34, 18, I'm sorry, 35, 18. There was no Passover like the one kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Josiah kept. Everybody loved him. Jeremiah loved him. Everybody loved this man. But verse 20, three key words, after all this. After all that. That's why we need to continue all the way to the end. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple... Necho, the king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by the Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. So what's happening is two kings, two godless kings are coming together for battle there. And Josiah wants to get in and meddle in that. And it's a strange place for the word of God. But the word of God can come any, any way, any time, any place. Even if it's the mouth of a donkey it came out last week. But so Josiah came out against to come out against, you know, these two, two kings. He was going to side with one of them. But the one king from Egypt says, What do I have to do with you, thou king of Judah? I Don't come and meddle this day. I've, ma I've come to make war, for God has commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God. So this it's a strange place for God's word to show up. But it showed up in this king of Egypt, who it wasn't a God-fearing king. But God spoke to him and said, I want you to go into battle here and take this king. And don't meddle with me, Josiah. This is the word of the Lord. But Josiah b busts through that red light. Again, God brings people in your life to stop you from going your own way. And if you, know, you want to run them over, that's okay. But God says, stop from your own way. That's what he's doing. He says, Josiah, don't meddle in this affair. This is not your affair. This is of God. 
And you know what he does here, verse 22, Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and hearken not unto the word of Necho from the mouth of God, and came to fight. You wanted some Old Testament stories here, but that's just the way it's working out. We need to get in the word and learn these stories. And the archer shot at King Uzziah, or I'm sorry, Josiah, and he wounded him. He died. He died at 39 years old. Disobedience had brought death. In verse 25, Jeremiah cried over Josiah, all the singing and men. They cried over this man who's passion for the Lord, but at the end of his life, he, he turned away and it brought death to him. Three kings, three passionate about the Lord, but did not continue to obey the Lord. And it's, like I said, God is with us as we are with Him. If you forsake Him, He's going to forsake you. If you abide in Him, He'll abide in you. If you draw near Him, He'll draw near you. If you honor Him, men I know that have honored the Lord by their lives, God has honored them. Not that you're looking for that, but God has honored them. If you reject, you know, if, if you reject me, the word of God, I reject you as being king. And you know, God is always there with his open arms, but I mean it's it's uh, God is with you while you are with him. You know, some things that a lot of times not taught, but it's where are we tonight? You know, what what does God spoke to us tonight? You know, just pay attention to to that small, still voice. That's the Spirit of God speaking to you. I know the Spirit of God speaks much more than my human words coming up out of my mouth. He's speaking to you. Don't throw it aside and just, oh, that was just a passing thought. I, I want to push it aside. I didn't like that. I'm going to push this aside. I'll take this, but I'm going to push this aside. Pay attention to the small, still voice. He's, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you tonight. Well, what do you, what do you want to do about it? You know, what are you going to do about that? And that's what's before us now. So either in our hearts we say, Lord, you know, I repent from that. I confess that. You know, and you, you go God's way and whatever that means. But he's with us while we're with him. So it's the battle. Is, it's a fight to the finish. He that is faithful to the end shall be. He that endures the end shall be saved. Be faithful to the end and I'll give him the crown of life. So faithfulness is what he's looking for. I heard a story about a man of God that he's uh, he's very sickly. His wife has got like Alzheimer's, and his, one of his sons has early signs of Parkinson's. One of his twins, and he had uh, one of his children uh, was driving, and the son was in her eyes, and she actually ran over a little boy in the road. All the same family, and you know what? You know, what, what are we going to endure before we get out of this mess? What are we going to be going through? You know, it's the preparation time for all them storms, you know, is, is now. You know, preparation for storms is not two years, four years down the road. Preparation for storms is obey the Lord now, and he strengthen you with might in the inner man so that when you, when you get to the situation, you know, it's, you know, we'll have some substance there. Paul says, nothing moves me. Now, I can be moved, but I know that he puts something in me as, we, as I've walked with him. And I'm not, a, I'm not anybody, but he's put something in me. And as I continue to obey him and follow him, he puts more in me and more in me. And Paul came to a place that nothing moves him. I, I believe I could still be moved. If I get a phone call, this happened or that happened. But he's put some things in me, he put his character in me. In, in, in Hebrews it says you shall receive a kingdom that shall not be shaken and how does he do that we, he, he shakes anything that's shakeable out of you he shakes when I was in Bible school I remember Pastor Jake I pictured him taking like uh, the Lord taking a Christian up by his, upside down with his feet and he's shaking anything shakeable that can shake out of you that nothing it's all all that can shakeable is shaked out of you and it's 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 firm it's steadfast. It's, it's strengthened you. So the Lord wants to, if you're in a weak place tonight, that's a good place. You, you know his strength. You rely on him. So don't, don't be in a hurry to get out of the situation. Look to the Lord each day and, uh, for his strength.